Hello, I'm Heather Hurlbert. I run the New Models of Policy Change Initiative at New America's Political Reform Program. And we, along with the National Fellows Program, are very happy to welcome you to this webinar for the launch of David Rhodes' new book, In Deep. Um, we will be talking together for about half an hour, and then we will spend the second half an hour taking your questions. If you think or as you think of questions during our initial conversation, please use the Q&A button at the bottom in the middle of your screen to submit your questions. Please also note if the description of the book piques your interest, you can go to our website um, and to the page for this event and you'll find a link to buy in deep from Solid State Books. Um, we're very proud to have David Rode as a class of 20 Arizona State University Fellow at New America. He's the author of four books, a two-time winner of the Pulitzer Prize for international reporting, and a former reporter for Reuters, The New York Times, and the Christian Science Monitor. He's currently the executive editor for online news at The New Yorker. And after spending his entire career in the US, in the Balkans, in South Asia, chasing down instances of um, both elected and unelected officials lying to the public and getting away with it, I think it's safe to say, David, that you've literally spent your professional life getting ready to write this book. For the first question, is there a deep state? I conclude that there is not a deep state uh, as Donald Trump defines it, and that, that's a coup, um, a group of people who are secretly <clears throat> and actively plotting against him. Uh, there is a, a permanent government. There are about you know, 3 million Americans who work for the federal government at any given time in various agencies. Um, but no president, you know, every president has complained about coming to Washington and having bureaucrats stifle their goals. Ronald Reagan said the State Department was liberal and wasn't carrying out his agenda to counter communism. Barack Obama worried that the Pentagon you know, was leaking troop numbers uh, for a possible surge in Afghanistan and sort of boxing him in in that way, but no president has accused, um, you know, government officials, career government officials of plotting a, a coup against them in secret. And did you conclude that there was in fact a, something like a coup attempt going on? Uh, that, no. Is that the best way to, just, to describe what we, the, the very unusual back and forth between the career officials and political appointees we saw in the administration? I think it is. I mean, the, the, the president's, and I, I want to, there's some things that are understandable in the president's reaction, um, but he's chosen to use this rhetoric of, of a conspiracy, you know, of a coup, uh, and, and it's, it's an exaggeration. It's, it's simply not true. Um, look, government officials uh, fight over turf. Uh, they have uh, personal uh, biases. They want their budgets to grow. But, you know, that's very different from trying to, you know, plot secretly to undermine the goals of an elected leader. Um, I talked to career government officials. They, they just denied anything like this existed. Um, the president's had three years to sort of une unearth, you know, the, 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 this plot. Uh, he has effectively removed uh, senior officials from uh, uh, various agencies, uh, Justice Department and others. So I, I, I did not find evidence of this. And I even had uh, members of the administration privately admit to me that they thought the talk of a coup, again, current members of the Trump administration say to me that they agreed that talking about a coup uh, by a deep state was an exaggeration. You, you use a significant chunk of the book walking through the history of um, problematic, illegal um, behaviors by various parts of the law enforcement and national security infrastructure. Um, do you see that as forming the foundation for these ideas about a deep state? How does, how does the, the history of struggle over what our national security infrastructure is allowed to do and the history of struggle over oversight, how does that intersect with this idea of a deep state? Um, well, it's, it's really interesting, you know, you mentioned this before we started, but just today, um, the head of the Office of Management and Budget for the Trump administration said that there should not be, uh, that, that uh, there should not be an apolitical or this idea of an apolitical civil service, that it'd be better to revert to a pure patronage uh, system. Uh, to go way back, the patronage system, you know, started in the 1880s. Uh, one of the drivers was the assassination of President James Garfield by a supporter of his who expected to be named an ambassador. Uh, it was, he was sort of delusional about this appointment, uh, who was frustrated when he didn't get the job and, and shot and killed him in Washington. 
the book, though, really starts in the 1970s and with the church reform investigation, which exposed decades of abuses by the FBI and the CIA. And this is where, you know, President Trump is right. Uh, the FBI and the CIA are extremely powerful organizations. They're more powerful than ever in the digital age. You know, more of our personal information can be connected, uh, sorry, collected without us realizing it than ever. And the book sort of looks at the church reforms, the abuses they discovered by uh, both agencies, and then talks about these mechanisms that were set up after the church reforms and after Watergate to try to stop abuses by the FBI and CIA. And then a separate theme is also, you know, how do you, you know, how do you stop a president from abusing these powers also? You've reported on in your career mm -hmm. and book covers an enormous sweep of these events. And I think any of us, however old or young we are, there's probably at least one of them that we had that we've forgotten. I found in reading the book, I thought, oh, I'm going to know everything in here already. And there were several um, sort of amazing and terrifying episodes from the US past that, that I had forgotten. What's the episode or the scandal that you that you wish more Americans were aware of or that you thought had the most to say about how how we got into this situation of, of mutual mistrust that we're in now? I guess it's one of the people I interviewed for the book. Uh, his name was uh, Fritz Schwartz. He was the one of the main staffers on the church committee. And uh, Fritz Schwartz, you know, his, his middle initials are A-O. Uh, his name is F-A-O Schwartz. Uh, I think it's the third or the fourth. So he is, a, you know, a, a, a young man, whatever, a, a, a member of the F-A-O Schwartz family that had the famous toy store in Manhattan. And he described during his investigations of the CIA and FBI that he, he thought he would like better the, the CIA officials. And at that point, they were overwhelmingly wasps like him and elitists. You know, he went to Harvard. And uh, when Schwartz actually did these interviews, he actually liked the FBI agents better as people. Uh, they were, you know, they went to, they weren't members of the elite. Um, and what was sort of blood chilling to him was how effective these CIA officials, uh, many members of the American elite like him, could lie perfectly uh, without him realizing it. Um, and then the fascinating part of it and the theme for me was that the FBI officials talked about that they did these things. They um, surveilled Martin Luther King and tried to discredit him because of the, the fear of communism. They also abused groups on the right, the John Birch Society. And there was this sort of rationale that FBI officials had come up with that they had to kind of take matters into their own hand to protect the country from a dangerous foreign threat or infiltration by its enemies. And it's that rationale. I, I don't, I think, um, one of the dangers of human nature, you know, are, are that people do things wrong and they, they like to do it, you know, uh, they like to steal things and uh, harm others. Um, but I think the biggest danger with people is our ability to kind of rationalize our actions and that we're somehow working to defend our way of life or defend our family uh, against an enemy. And I see a lot of that happening in our kind of tribalized politics. So I admire the work of the church committee. It was largely bipartisan. It was a groundbreaking investigation. It created a huge number of reforms. So, you know, that's effective governance. And that was a thing to see. But I worry about, you know, how divided we are and how each side is so convinced that they're right. And the other is a danger uh, to the country. This notion of, of bipartisanship, both bipartisanship as the solution to the problem, as you just put forward, but also your framing of the problem as in its own way a bipartisan one um i think is is one that's it that's not the usual frame with which people <laughs> approach this issue um you know many of us tend to see it as either a problem of the left or a problem of the right and so i wonder what do you think when you were setting out to write the book what do you think you gained by insisting and obviously that there's nothing bipartisan about the particular Trump administration version of this. So what do you think you gained by framing it in that bipartisan way? And are there things that you feel maybe get obscured or are harder to see from, from that both sides do it frame? It's, it's a great question. And, and, you know, maybe this was sort of a retro approach to this book and to, to journalism. But I will say that, you know, what 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 did happen sort of with the church committee and the investigations of abscam the scandal in the 80s and iran contra uh you know 9 11 what went wrong there were you know investigations that came out with basic facts that 
there was a consensus on, and maybe bipartisanship is the wrong term, but as we sit here today with the coronavirus, you know, if we can agree on basic facts, the, the danger that the virus proposes, uh, presents, you know, what's the best way to counter it and, and limit the deaths, you know, we can't effectively function, I think, as a society or, or a democracy. So maybe bipartisanship is, is you know, going too far. Um, I do think, you know, part of the problem, part of the reason I wrote this is because, you know, there is a, a lack of faith in, in our institutions. Um, there was a 2018 poll that found that 70% of Americans think that there is a secret group of unelected officials and, and military officials who manipulate U.S. policy. People don't trust the media. I'm a, I'm a mainstream journalist. So I'm wondering if we focus more on fact or try to get consensus around basic facts, at least as journalists or in this book, it will help us in this, these, these troubled times. But I completely accept that that is naive and, um, and it was, some would argue that that's naive. But my approach was try to, to try to have a factual investigation of whether a deep state exists as, as Donald Trump defines it. You're frozen. I think we oh, lost Heather for a moment. Um, hi, I'm Sarah. I'm the program <laughs> manager, and I'll just pop in. I was wondering if you could talk a little bit more about that lack of faith in institutions and um, sort of what you might suggest as far as a permanent government, a small permanent government, and, and what your um, takeaways were in the researching of the book. So starting out in the 70s, you know, there was a bunch of reforms made by, you know, President Ford and President Carter, um, Ford, you know, they both banned assassinations abroad by the CIA. There was a change where if a president was going to carry out a covert action program, in the past it was a conversation between a CIA director and a president. They had to put together written findings uh, that would authorize the covert action. The findings go to uh, leaders in Congress and leaders of, uh, of both parties. Uh, intelligence oversight committees were created that had subpoena powers to, to watch over these agencies. And then uh, there were inspect general uh, created to look at how the government was functioning and look for fraud and abuse. And lastly, the, the judicial branch was involved. Uh, it's now famous or infamous, but the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court um, was created and that was designed to prevent the FBI from carrying out uh, improper uh, wiretapping. I found that that, the, that new set of rules, and I had CIA and FBI officials tell me that they resented that system at first, but they actually liked oversight in the end, again, many people will scoff at this um, because it gave them kind of rules of the road and that they, you know, if they you know, sort of, you know, notified Congress, I'm sure they don't notify Congress of everything, you know, they could not be, you know, uh, face arrest or, or um, you know, attacks for their actions if they, if they followed these, this basic new system, this sort of, I call it the post-church reform system. So I, I think it has worked. Um, you know, and I, I, I'm, I think it's fraying now, and that, that's one of the reasons I wrote the book. Well, I apologize for dropping out there. Um, I wonder how you would extend um, this thinking to what we're seeing now around coronavirus, and again, our inability to agree on basic facts, and where, where some of what you look at in this book um, provides us a useful roadmap for what to do and not to do. Well, again, it's this, it's a suspicion of, of government officials. Um, it's kind of a rejection of the idea that anyone can sort of be an apolitical expert. And, and I, I think again, since Watergate, since the seventies, there, there was a belief that there was a way for the justice department to kind of prosecute cases uh, in, in a largely apolitical manner. Uh, and then there's a way that you could have a government official like, uh, you know, Dr. Tony Fauci, um, who is, not perfect. Um, you know, some of the models, you know, turned out to, you know, be have higher numbers of possible deaths than were expected. But, you know, I sense that he is sort of doing his level best to give the best information he can to the country. If you have every single uh, player be political, um, if you just have a giant patronage, uh, you know, civil service, you know, everything will be, you know, will have a political angle uh, attached to it. Um, I know that many Republican and conservatives think that everything is political. Um, one uh, Democratic senator told me that he thought about 40% of uh, Republicans in the Senate uh, felt that 
you know, there is a deep state in terms of this, of an administrative state. And that would be an ever growing uh, federal government that's sort of relentlessly invading people's lives and taking away their rights. And there's a sense that anyone, you know, a sense among conservatives, they sort of idealize the private sector, that if you're really excelling or an extraordinary person, you're going to want to be in the private sector and, and want to achieve there. And so there's an assumption that, you know, anyone who is a career government official uh, leans left and is just, you know, going to want the government to grow and is going to slow roll or, or block uh, conservative proposals. Um, you know, their government, you know, career government officials are barred by the Hatch Act from doing that. But this is, again, part of our, our sort of divide. And it came up again with the coronavirus, with the recent protests where people are just dismissing the advice of medical experts um, and saying it's unnecessary. And, and I, I feel like, again, our, our democracy is sort of fraying as we, we fight over basic facts. In, in all of this. Um, and I was really fascinated, actually, you had a quote um, of a member of Congress, I think, going all the way back to the church hearings and saying, we're looking into the edge of it, we're looking into an abyss where the government can know everything there is to know about us in the not too distant future. Um, so it, it's almost as if we, we knew, or some of us knew for 40 or 50 years exactly what was coming. And it came anyway, and then this can be understood as the backlash to it. And yet, going forward, both in the health area and in intelligence, we're going to be more and more operating in this um, high tech and big data space. Do you did you see anything hopeful or models around how to how to conduct effective oversight, how to build civil civic trust, or how to even start from a common space of knowledge about about these issues? So there is one area of, of cooperation, and it is on uh, eavesdropping and the National Security Agency. And that's where you have a political alliance uh, between Senator Rand Paul, the Libertarian Republican of Kentucky, and Ron Wyden, the very liberal senator um, from Oregon. And they both are deeply suspicious of the government's attempts to monitor us. They're very worried about you know, the digital age and have been pushing and pushing to kind of rein in the NSA. So there is one uh, common area um, that Americans don't like surveillance. In the poll I mentioned, the 2018 poll, um, where 70% of Americans feared a deep state, um, the two groups that feared it most uh, on one side were, were NRA members. They feared again that this large administrative state was going to you know, take away their rights uh, and their arms. And then also um, uh, minorities, um, you know, people of color, that you could imagine that African Americans would be very suspicious of the government, um, of the FBI, and the whole criminal justice system, uh, given what's happened over decades with disproportionate sentencing and things like that. So in this age of sort of utter division, uh, there is a way to rally around, I think the digital age and privacy, um, the power of tech companies is something that I think people on the left and the right fear. And, and uh, there is sort of real progress on that. You know, Rand Paul and, and uh, Ron Wyden are introducing joint legislation all the time. It doesn't always make it very far, but that cooperation is happening. Hmm. Um, and you also <laughs> conducted well, both both before and during the um, the um, events of, of impeachment. You've talked a lot to career intelligence officials, and I think some of them you you talk a lot about divisions within the agencies and the limits of the agency's desire for meaningful oversight um, and relationship with the American people, which goes back to the, the comment you made earlier about you, know, you have some proportion of, of an organization that, that, um, that does not always want to do what is construed in the oversight sector as the right thing. So where do you see, where do you see the actual workforce, the people who, who make up the civil state, the whatever you're, you're going to call it, where do you see that, that group of employees going on its relationship with their political overlords of whatever party? Uh, so uh, one of the main characters in the book is uh, an FBI agent named Tom O'Connor. Uh, he was a cop in uh, Western Massachusetts and, and joined the FBI several decades ago. Um, his career is amazing. He, he essentially travels the world investigating terrorism. He's uh, after the USS Cole is bombed, he is on the coal and recovers the body of the sailors. On 9-11, he responds to the Pentagon. 
uh, he and other FBI agents, uh, you know, are there for days and they end up collecting uh, more than 2,000 um, bags of human remains. Uh, he goes to Iraq and investigates the Blackwater uh, shooting in Baghdad that killed dozens of Iraqis, and he also investigates white supremacists in the U.S. So Tom O'Connor retired on 9-11 this year, um, and he was really alienated, not from, you know, Trump or the Democrats, just the political class and the political process as a whole. Um, he was part of the hearings uh, that John Stewart testified about, you know, first responders not getting enough assistance from the government, the many cancers that were growing there. Um, and I asked Tom, now that he was retiring, you know, what, what are you going to do? And he, you know, he wasn't sure. And I said, well, would you ever, you know, you, you, you frustrated with Congress, you're frustrated with politicians in general, would you ever run, uh, you know, for office? And he said, you know, no, I want to do something that has meaning. And so I sense a kind of alienation um, from both political parties, a sense that as politicians duke it out and as the media dukes it out too, you know, that the run of the mill people, the, the, you know, FBI agents, and I know many people fear the FBI, even CIA operatives feel that they're sort of being, you know, thrown under the bus, um, you know, and that they're more and more discouraged. Uh, recruitment numbers are okay. They're, they're good at the FBI. That's, that's what they told me. I've heard roughly the same thing from the CIA. But I, I worry it's a very, you know, bad sign for our democracy when, you know, people, and I think we need an FBI for better or worse. We need intelligence services for better or worse to protect the country and its citizens. But when they're this alienated, it's, it's really dangerous, I think. Well, that brings us to the, um, the Trump impeachment hearings, which you go into in some detail in the book, um, where I think many Americans were introduced to um, intelligence and foreign affairs workers as, as heroes. And you saw a real lionizing of, of the State Department's Foreign Service and of the Civil Service in, in a way that you, you really haven't seen um, since the end of the Cold War, particularly for the, the non-military side. Um, how did that go down inside the bureaucracy, I guess was my first question. And second, do you think that forms a foundation for moving forward with a better understanding between political and career? Or do we risk sort of going too far the other way and lionizing people who, as your book amply documents, have made a lot of mistakes and have also been very willing to push the boundaries, if not exceed the law over time? Well, I think it, you know, it depends on the individual, you know, there's bad uh, members of any profession, whether it's, you know, diplomats or the FBI or, or journalists for that matter. What was interesting about the hearings, and I think the reason I think they were successful for part of the country, and I'll, I'll come back to that, is that, you know, uh, Masha Yovanovitch and, and Fiona Hill uh, and, and other witnesses tried to be apolitical, uh, even, you know, Bob Mueller in his own way, um, tried to kind of play it straight. And I, and I think that was uh, refreshing for Americans who believe that you do need, you know, a political public servants. You need a, a local police chief that's going to equally enforce the law. You need, you know, school teachers that are going to teach the, the jointly agreed upon curriculum, not, in, you know, inject their own ideas. You know, those are public servants. But I don't think that that view, you know, spread through roughly half the country that, you know, passionately supports the president. They you know, weren't convinced, they weren't impressed with those testimonies. So, um, but, and this goes back to your earlier question about this sort of taking this approach in the book of not bipartisanship, but as a journalist trying to be factual, um, I think there's a, there are, you know, a need for commentators and, and there's lots of them these days, but some journalists need to try to just play it straight and present the facts. Um, and, and we need that more than ever. I think to, and I, you know, you know, in a way that, that many of those uh, witnesses did uh, during the impeachment. Well, this brings us um, to Attorney General Barr, I think, and you are perhaps one of the, the leading students of, of Attorney General Barr. And um, I want to ask you to, to go back and, and summarize his resume a little bit, because I think many Americans may not know how deeply embedded he's been in this debate about what the national security state has the right to do, what the executive branch has the right to do over, over 40 or, or 50 years. So um, I, I wonder 
Um, I wonder if you could just give us a flavor of how his career intersects with the development of, of this controversy. So, uh, and I want to be fair to, to the Attorney General, uh, throughout his whole career, he has believed that, you know, we need a stronger uh, presidency, a very strong executive branch to defend the country and hold it together in, in sort of moments of, of national crisis like this one right now in the midst of a, of a pandemic. I, I talked to some of his high school classmates and they said he always, you know, viewed uh, the presidency as more powerful, as necessarily more powerful than other branches. Uh, he actually got his start out, um, you know, it was the middle of the Vietnam War and he actually interned at the CIA and worked at the CIA as an analyst. Um, he met George H.W. Bush when he was a, an aide um, uh, at a con congressional hearing. Uh, Bella Abzug, uh, a famous representative from the 1970s who was the far on the left and was famous for her big hats, was demanding that the CIA be forced to send a letter to every American uh, whose mail the CIA had opened during the Cold War. This was probably hundreds of thousands of Americans. And George H.W. Bush, who was the CIA director at the time, wasn't sure how to answer the question. He turned around and asked Bill Barr uh, for how to answer the question. And Barr was thrilled because George H.W. Bush gave the answer Barr advised him to give. Um, Barr went on to serve as uh, Bush's attorney general. And he advocated, and he's not alone, uh, in a sense that post Watergate, the presidency was working too much, that there shouldn't have been congressional oversights committee committees. Uh, and then Barr talked about this recently in terms of the judiciary in his speech at the Federal Society. He said the courts, you know, that the idea that federal judges on the West Coast could block the president's executive orders on immigration, he thought was an infringement on the president's power. And his philosophy is that if you look at American history, when the U.S. has faced war, uh, when 9-11 happened, you need the executive branch uh, to act quickly to mobilize and defend the country. Congress can't do that uh, because it's so divided in a cumbersome process. And so, you know, he joined the administration, he said, to try to protect and strengthen the presidency. And it's, so it's not some new thing. It's not some excuse he's come up with to help Donald Trump. It's a long-running uh, philosophy among some conservatives. Antonin Scalia supported it. Uh, way back when uh, Dick Cheney uh, did as well. So um, it's not new. And as I, I've said in the book and, and said in a profile in The New Yorker, I think Barr is the most effective member of the cabinet. He is uh, helping the president in a variety of ways, but particularly in asserting executive power. So I'm going to ask you one more question, and then we're going to go to some of the questions that have come in. But paradoxically, something I took away from the sweep of the book is that rather than see this as a fight between a shadowy deep state, that it's almost as if there's been for 40 or 50 years perfectly out in public if we cared to see it, this fight over what executive power is, what presidential power is, and that what has happened is that this, this group of people who were written off as fringe, as you repeatedly note in the 70s, are now mainstream, and that both sides have been able to draw on people within the civil service to, to do their will. And I wonder, I wonder how you, whether you see that as a viable alternate thesis. I do. And um, it is a, you know, it's a central, it's how do you prevent the CIA and the FBI from carrying out abuses? And then how do you prevent a president from doing so? Uh, and it is a, a wrestling a power between the three branches of government. I guess what's different is that, and I, I want to, Donald Trump is an amazing communicator and people who dismiss him as mentally unbalanced or, you know, he doesn't know what he's doing are, are, are totally underestimating him and I think totally wrong. What he's done is, you know, question the legitimacy of congressional oversight. And what he's doing is reducing Congress's power by, you know, saying he was going to defy all subpoenas from Congress, you know, more than any other president, uh, you know, is shifting the balance of power. He's not just acting erratically, he is centralizing uh, power. By, you know, calling the media fake news, he's, you know, discrediting us uh, as a source of information. And this is this sort of broad pattern that Trump has used very successfully since he joined politics when he came in on the national scene and said that, you know, question whether Barack Obama was uh, born in the United States. Uh, Trump, um, Stephen Giller is an NYU professor, was, it's, this is his idea. He's very effective at spreading conspiracy theories about rivals, about rival sources of information or rival sources of power, and discrediting 
those other sources. And at the same time, he's limiting the amount of information about his own activities. Uh, and, and, and he's succeeded in that there was just a ruling in, in February, for example, that Don McGahn did not have to testify before Congress. It'll go to the Supreme Court. You know, but, you know, Charlie Savage wrote in the New York Times that if that ruling stands, it will have an impact for decades in terms of increasing a president's power uh, to resist oversight uh, from Congress. And future presidents are going to, you, you know, even if Trump were to lose in November, future presidents are going to take advantage of that, uh, that power, um, whether they're Republican or, or Democrats. It's an amazing moment in American history. And as I wrote the book, this all kind of came together in, in my own mind as well. So if what you've just laid out, though, is that if, if, you, if you value free flow of information, but someone has discovered that a way to, to perpetuate political power is to restrict flow of information, that seems like a very uneven fight. Well, <laughs> the, the counter argument is that um, it's just the belief that the opposition in Congress is going to attack the president. Uh, and this was the view Democrats had of the Republican-controlled Congress during the Obama administration, that there were, you know, the endless congressional investigations uh, into the ATF uh, that exaggerated things Democrats claimed into the IRS. You know, again, Democrats dismissed it. And then most famously into Hillary Clinton and, and Benghazi. And um, that's the danger, I think, is it's this view uh, that everything is partisan, a kind of a view and um, that everyone's got an angle, everybody's lying, everybody's, you know, trying to score a point, even if they're a, you know, a career diplomat or working the IRS. And, and I, I hope that doesn't exist. I, I didn't find a widespread examples of that. But it just comes back again, the coronavirus, if, if we can't agree on basic facts, if every single medical expert that's part of the president's task force is seen as some scheming political player who's either helping the president or hurting him. How do you respond to a pandemic? How do you get people to believe government right now, you know, shows the need for some sort of expertise and some sort of, I'll say it, bipartisan agreement about basic facts. This is about lives. Um, it's rare. Um, people should fight for the policies they want but we need a nimble government that is trusted, um, you know, and, and effective. So we've got a great question here that goes directly to this point about coronavirus. Um, someone asks whether you think it's true that the anti-quarantine protests that we've seen in a number of states, although they appear to be spontaneous, are actually uh, organized by a network behind the scenes. And so I will first ask you, to comment on, on that, that question. And then I'll ask you to, to consider the meta question of what do we do when we say, well, this side's conspiracy theories are fake and crazy, but that side's conspiracy theories are real. How do we, how do we deal with that? So it's a great question. Uh, I'm not an expert on any of these uh, uh, demonstrations of what's happening. I've just read the same news reports as everybody else. I think that there's a large number of Americans that, um, you know, don't trust the government and feel that, that the, you know, stay at home orders are excessive. So I think they're these, I don't know if, if they're secretly being organized, but let's not question the motivation of the other side. Let's not decide that, that they're not real protests. They're, they're just organized. You know, I think you look at, look at their size, you know, most opinion polls show, show that about 60% of Americans think the restrictions should stay in place. So it does look like, you know, the protesters don't represent the majority of Americans. But unless you can prove that, you know, the other side is engaged in a secret plot and it's all fake, um, I think it's best to not uh, question that. Or anyone, anyone can question anything they want. It's just the constant, it's the sort of cycle of kind of distrust and conspiracy theory that's just, you know, endless. Um, a lot of it's the web. We can talk about the press and the web, but I just worry, you know, how this cycle just gets more and more intense on both sides. Of course, there is this problem that science and proof are really somewhat inimical to each other. And so how do we prove or disprove? I mean, if, if we can't, for example, prove or disprove death projection, fatality projections for the coronavirus, 
we're, we're really back into a slippery territory where my facts are just as good as your facts. Yeah, and I, it's, it's a tough one. I guess I would ask people to be skeptical of, of government numbers that have, that have come out, uh, the, but to hope, I mean, these are uh, individual doctors doing death certificates who have been trained in medicine. And, and but not cynical about them. I, I and many people are, will shake their heads. I don't think that you know thousands of doctors across the country are part of some plot to exaggerate or undercount uh, deaths at this point. They're they're sort of frantically uh, trying to do the right thing. And then in terms of the media, and this is maybe obvious, or and I have a bias as a journalist, but. Um, you know, for conservatives, I would urge them if they're seeing some crazy thing on Facebook and they're not seeing it reported, you know, in the mainstream media, you know, the most, I think the place to look if you're a conservative are the news pages of the Wall Street Journal. It's owned by Rupert Murdoch, you know, clearly he owns Fox News as well and is leans right and, and, and Fox clearly supports the president. Um, but if it's not in the news pages of the Wall Street Journal, it's probably false. Try to read, you know, things you see online with more skepticism. Um, and one difference, and I'm again biased, but when I write a piece for the New Yorker or when any of the main magazines or newspapers or news organizations report things, you know, we can be sued under libel law. I have a lawyer reading every story I write. Um, that is a good check on me not defaming someone or just printing something that's completely false. One of the strange things that came about as the internet emerged was that. Twitter and Google and Facebook have no liability, no responsibility whatsoever to verify the information that's appearing on their websites. So anyone can say anything they want um, on these platforms uh, and smear people and defame them and spread conspiracy theories and there's no check on that whatsoever uh, legally. And that's why I would sort of urge people to trust the media a little bit or trust the, you know, the right-leaning or left-leaning media, um, I want to, they're bad journalists, but I think most, most journalists who are not commentators, you know, are trying to get the, the facts straight as, as best they know them. We're, we're imperfect, but uh, I would be skeptical of journalists, but not cynical. So we've had several questions about specific methods that might be used to try to reestablish trust in facts or a common set of national facts. And so I think I'll, I'll run through several of these and invite you to, to comment on, on any or all of them. Um, can you point to a time in the past where American trust in government was actually restored? What brought that out about in the past and how we could trend toward it again in the future? Um, what do you think about the possibility of something on the model of a Truth and Reconciliation Commission to address past issues um, and past issues of, of violations of trust? And what do you think specifically about the role of fear um, that fear plays in American life in driving this, this move um, toward, as the questioner puts it, toward feelings and away from facts? Huh. It's a great question, and I, um, I'll try to come up with an answer. I'll go back to some of the examples I, I cited. I, I think that the church reform was a very effective um, uh, mechanism. One of the amazing things that happened was that um, several, this was a, you know, a step by Jimmy Carter, uh, several senior FBI officials were actually put on trial for breaking into Americans' houses and wiretapping them. Um, these were Americans engaged in constitutionally protected uh, political activities. Um, and black job operations were carried out by the FBI without warrants from judges to, to wiretap them. They were actually convicted. Uh, one of those um, officials that was convicted was Mark Felt, uh, a deputy director of the FBI who was deep throat. Um, throughout his trial in the late 70s, he didn't reveal he was deep throat. Uh, Woodward and Bernstein didn't either. Um, but that was an amazing amount of accountability for the American people to see that, you know, that could be, could be carried out. Um, so I think investigations can restore confidence. I think the 9-11 Commission was very effective. I mean, there's clearly 9-11 truthers out there, but it did create a, you know, a consensus, a basic narrative of what went wrong in 9-11 that most Americans um, agreed upon. Uh, just yesterday, you know, the Senate Foreign Relations Committee came out uh, agreeing with the intelligence assessment that Russia did uh, intervene in the election to aid Trump. Um, it might have been better to have a nonpartisan commission to look at you know, uh, the 2016 election and I think the Trump-Russia investigation. And, and a last thing um, I, I really want to point out and not forget, um, 
great work by the Inspector General, the Justice Department, Michael Horowitz, um, his report, you know, exposed, and I think this is an example too, that Carter Page was improperly surveilled at the final, um, not the first two um, applications to the, to the FISA court were improper, but that the last two were. And that a low level FBI uh, lawyer changed an email that said that, you know, Carter Page was the focus of FBI attention because he was meeting with Russian officials. The email originally said that Page was cooperating with the FBI, I'm sorry, with the CIA and telling them uh, about these meetings. Uh, and that email was, the meaning of it was reversed. So to say that, uh, you know, he, he was not cooperating with the CIA. Um, I've talked to people close to that lawyer. They claim it was sort of a mistake and, and the, the lawyer didn't mean it wasn't as nefarious as that seems, but that's outrageous. And, and I, I think that it's wrong that Carter Page was surveilled for longer than he should have. At the same time, uh, you know, Trump Tower was not surveilled. Uh, Horowitz found that the, the investigation into Trump Russia was justified legally. Uh, we lowered the, the, the amount of evidence needed for the FBI to carry out an investigation after 9-11 so they could quickly investigate anyone they wanted. There need to be reforms. I think the FISA court has failed in terms of limiting surveillance. Uh, big reforms there. Um, I support Bill Barr's idea of, of creating a higher standard for anyone involved in a political campaign to be surveilled. I think that's a great idea. So things went wrong, but again, this is not a sort of coup by the FBI uh, to you know, wiretap Trump Tower um, during the campaign. Okay, yeah, so follow-up question. If what was disclosed in the Horowitz report doesn't reach the level of a coup or a conspiracy, what would be? Uh, what would what would be your your line for a concerted partisan effort to interfere in the political process? Um, the FBI would have leaked the fact that they were investigating the Trump campaign's contacts with Russia during the 2016 campaign. Uh, I was one of dozens of journalists who uh, got a copy of the dossier from uh, Glenn Simpson of GPS Fusion. I should say one of my colleagues at Reuters got it. Uh, I ran around. I asked Justice Department officials if they could confirmed that Carter Page was meeting with Russian officials and that he was being investigated. Justice Department officials refused to do that. Uh, during the campaign, uh, I met with John Brennan uh, about six weeks before the election. I was doing a big piece. I was working for Reuters at that point on John Brennan's reforms of the CIA. I was sitting in the director's office in, in Langley in the headquarters and looking out the window and um, there's this sort of amazing view of all this, these green trees and this verdant landscape out the window. And I asked Brennan, is it true that Russia, you know, has compromising videotapes of the Republican nominee, Donald Trump? And, you know, uh, Brennan sort of seemed, you know, shocked by the question. And then he just very clearly said, I am not commenting on that in any way, shape or form. I'm not confirming it. I'm not denying it. And I, you know, I don't want, you know, any part of, of that is what he said. And then he urged me, he said, you know, you are going to hear a lot of crazy things, David, in the last six weeks of this campaign. You're going to hear, you know, crazy stories about Donald Trump. You're going to hear crazy stories about Hillary Clinton. And he urged me not to report them. He said, only report what you know, uh, you know, to be facts, something that you can clearly prove because of all the things that are happening right now. So anyway, in terms of the election, there's a conspiracy theory that Brennan was distributing uh, the, the dossier. He urged me not to write about it. Maybe he was lying to me, but that was my experience uh, with him. And so, you know, I think that, that this narrative of the Trump-Russia investigation or this plot to block Trump from being elected um, is off. And then the last thing I'd say, in terms of once he becomes president, um, he fires uh, James Comey. That leads to, a, you know, Mueller being appointed uh, you can argue Mueller never should have been appointed and, and you know, that's a longer conversation. But, you know, in the end, Mueller exonerates uh, Donald Trump or doesn't find enough evidence to prove that Donald Trump and his campaign colluded with Russia. The system worked in that sense, that Bob Mueller was nonpartisan, uh, you know, essentially cleared Trump of collusion. And I think it's important for liberals to accept Mueller's findings. It's not fair to declare Donald Trump, you know, uh, collaborated with Russia and was a Russian agent. That was investigated and we, people have to accept the facts of the, of the Mueller investigation. So I want to go back to the example of the 70s again for a moment. Um, we have a question about after 
the Pike and Church committees and the reforms of the 70s, how the FBI and CIA pushed back. And can we view some of the things that happened after that as retaliation or as a specific efforts to, in a way, go after um, attempt at, at greater congressional oversight? Um, well, folk, I'll, I'll focus on two people and, and you can argue this is a bias. So um, I interviewed uh, William Webster. The, if there's a member of the deep state, it's William Webster. He's the only American that's run both the FBI and, and the CIA. Uh, he's an extraordinary uh, person. When I asked him, I said, well, you know, people think you're a member of the deep, deep state. You know, Judge Webster, he was like puzzled. He said, you know, well, what is the deep state? Um, Webster, I think that, you know, there's heroes in the book and I, I think he's one of them. Uh, when the Abscam uh, investigation opened up and there were questions in Congress, is this an out of control J. Edgar Hoover like FBI sting operation where members of Congress were being videotaped accepting bribes? Um, you know, Webster accepted oversight. He opened up the FBI records to a special committee that was created. It was like a Watergate committee. Um, and having the legislative branch, I mean, he didn't push back, he didn't resist that oversight. He welcomed criminal trials and they got jury convictions in those criminal trials and that actually helped the FBI. So I think he was a positive uh, force. And then if you look at Iran-Contra, there was pushback. That would be a very different, you know, uh, CIA director, Bill Casey. And that was where all the, the, the things I talked about earlier, you know, the, the findings that had to be written and sent to Congress and both parties would learn about it, that was all ignored. Uh, there weren't, you know, there was a finding Reagan signed authorizing, you know, arms sales to Iran, but that finding was withheld for, from Congress so that Congress couldn't find out about it. Casey and his aides, you know, essentially lied to members of the Intelligence Committee about what they were doing. Uh, Casey has a stroke and passes away, and then Webster's brought in to sort of clean up the FBI, and it's a credit to President Reagan. He, you know, accepts that, that these new, you know, post-church reform uh, need for oversight, that there have to be written findings that, that both parties find out about, you know, that it's a big test of the system. Casey pushes against the system and I think fails um, at that point in the 80s. Reagan apologizes to the nation. There's questions about what he knew when, but congressional oversight, you know, continues uh, in the 80s. So yes, there was pushback, but the, the system held. The problem today is that these same committees have just degenerated into pure partisan warfare. Uh, the Intelligence Committee, um, you know, and it was one other character in the book is Will Hurd, a member of the Intelligence Committee, a former CIA officer, a Republican from Texas. Um, you know, he's, from his perspective, Donald Trump is a uh, unorthodox president. Um, Hurd felt that the call with Ukraine's president was amateurish, but he feels that Adam Schiff, you know, exaggerated uh, the scope of, you know, consistently the scope of ties between Trump and Russia. Uh, he points to a statement where Schiff said uh, there was beyond circumstantial evidence of, of collusion. Um, but anyway, it was interesting, the Gulf, where uh, Democrats see Trump as this existential threat to American democracy, and Will Hurd, again, sort of sees him as unorthodox, and, and which was shown in, you know, Hurd voting to not uh, impeach the president. So one more thing on the, the post-Church uh, Committee period and Abscam in particular, the questioner wonders whether the FBI's decision to target members of Congress specifically with sting operations as opposed to other officials could be seen as in some way retaliation or payback for the attempt to, to impose greater oversight. It could. I mean, it's, it's, it, it starts out with um, Mel, uh, God, I can't, Weinberg, I believe is his name, who's this amazing con man, you know, he's, he's in American Hustle, uh, and uh, the main character, and, uh, you know, he, he's in, I, I look, the, the narrative is that the thing snowballs, and that they're sort of shocked at how many members of Congress are accepting uh, these bribes, so it, it could have been, it starts in the Long Island field office uh, of the FBI, um, and, and, you know, I think that's possible. But then again, this, and, and a, the broad, a broad point is oversight of these incredibly powerful organizations by all branches of the government. So again, one of the reasons that, you know, Abscam at least is viewed as credible by Americans because there is a select committee that investigates it, a legislative committee, they have subpoenas, tons of testimony. You know, they don't find abuses. Uh, the, the chief counsel, 
of the select committee that investigated Abscan was also one of the main counsels of the Watergate committee. And then again, the judicial branch, jury trials for every member of Congress and the one senator all get uh, convictions, virtually all of them. So they're convicted by juries of their peers. So I think you need broader oversight. Our system is a mess. You have all three branches fighting with each other. Nothing can get done. It's very cumbersome. But it, you have the press looking into it. You have you know, judges overseeing jury trials. You have you know, congressmen trying to score points in their hearings. And if, if the FBI survives that, you know, that's the kind of rigor they should face. You don't want less oversight. You don't want less transparency. You don't want you know, less investigations by Congress or the courts or the press. You want more of them. I am biased, but as a journalist, I want more transparency. So that leads us maybe to one character and one episode in, in the, the sweep of your book that we haven't talked about, and that is Edward Snowden. And Snowden, I think, raises a couple of really interesting questions about this and the relationship between the kinds of things you could imagine in a deep state conspiracy before high-tech espionage comes along and the, the seemingly limitless additional scope both for high-tech conspiracies and for high-tech whistleblowing. So talk a little bit about how you see both the way the Snowden story unfolds and the, the technology that he uncovers, as how, how that helps get us to where we are now. So um, it's a great question. And, and to, to go back to my theme, I would say that of the various mechanisms set up to control these agencies, the biggest failure has been the FISA court. And, and one of the ironies Stop of- explain what the FISA court is, because now sure, I, I- So back in 1977, after all this, this, these illegal wiretaps were carried out, uh, it, it was created by Jimmy Carter, uh, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Court. So if the FBI, it's, it's primarily, first of all, if there's a criminal investigation, the FBI has to go and get a, a warrant from a judge, you know, anywhere around the country. That, that's just basic procedure. And, but there was a separate category with foreign intelligence investigations where the FBI would want to routinely you know, wiretap Russian diplomats or Chinese diplomats. In that process, they would see that these foreigners uh, you know, were interacting with American citizens. So essentially, American citizens were, citizens were being surveilled by the FBI uh, in terms of foreign intelligence activities. And also, you know, post 9-11, they're looking for any Americans who are talking possibly to Al-Qaeda members. So the idea there, though, is that the, it's a closed court. Uh, there is no advocacy. It's simply government lawyers. It's Justice Department lawyers presenting applications that are compiled by the FBI. There's no adversarial system. There's no defense lawyers. It's all kept in secret. Uh, I don't, you know, we, the proceedings, no one knows, none of the public. And over and over again, the court has failed. And the kind of one little detail of what Snowden revealed is that virtually all of the activities he revealed that the NSA was engaged in had been approved by the FISA court. Uh, one difference between you know, President Obama and President Bush, after 9-11, President Bush carried out warrantless eavesdropping. He, he just, this was this belief in the president has the power to do what's needed. He doesn't need the support of the other branches. Just started the warrantless wiretapping program without telling the FISA court. Uh, James Baker, who's one of the characters in the book, he's the general counsel of the FBI and works with Jim Comey. Um, he, many people hear about this warrantless wiretapping in the Justice Department and think it should go before the FISA court. The FISA court's told about it and a failure, they let warrantless you know, wiretapping continue. That's a big failure after 9-11. Um, the Carter Page case is a, is a failure now, at least of that system and the information the FBI was providing. But Obama made sure he, he, you know, same thing, executive power, all kinds of surveillance, but Obama sort of tried to obey the laws and sort of, you know, make it legal by presenting it to the FISA court, getting them to sign off on it. But many Americans were astonished when Snowden, you know, real, revealed to Americans that this breadth of surveillance was happening, but that was approved by a court. So I think the court has to be much more skeptical I think the, maybe there could be an adversarial process. I think you know, we as journalists should know more about what's going on. And I, I worry that you know, uh, blanket secretly, I'm sorry, blanket secrecy is sort of a recipe for abuses. 
So in some ways, maybe to wrap up, this brings us back to our contemporary moment and the problem of collecting the massive amounts of data on ourselves and our movements that seems as if it's going to be necessary to, to reopen um, any semblance of normal economic life and minimize the, the risks of, of coronavirus transmission. Do you, would you pull lessons for both federal and state authorities in how to think about data and facts and relating to the citizenry on these issues from, from the experience that you've chronicled? Yeah, I, I, we, we are completely um, unequipped uh, legally for the digital age. Um, there is no kind of consensus on, you know, when should the FBI be able to break into an iPhone um, in a criminal investigation. And our growing partisanship has prevented us from kind of reaching a sort of equilibrium. Um, and I, I think that it is an area, though, where we can agree that there should be um, stricter rules. Uh, one of the officials I interviewed for the story, you know, works for the National Security Administration. And, uh, you know, most data is actually held by private companies. And, you know, this person said that uh, eventually the, the private companies are going to hold, you know, more surveillance data, you know, than the NSA itself does. The NSA says it works overseas primarily. Um, but it's, this is an area where I think there is a chance for bipartisan agreement in terms of privacy, in terms of the power of big tech concentrations of, of power and data uh, are, are dangerous, I think. Um, and, you know, back to my Biden, I'm sorry, not my Biden, excuse me. <laughs> not the, there isn't going to be much of a bipartisan agreement involving President Trump and Joe Biden anytime soon, but in terms of Ron Wyden uh, and Rand Paul, that you know, we can agree on the need for some, uh, you know, norms in terms of privacy. Uh, there's a need maybe in terms of tracking and the coronavirus, but it's, this is an example to actually have agreement on something that, that could save lives and to just turn down, as I talked about, this cycle of endless um, partisan combat, uh, when it all stakes uh, politics and discredit uh, the other side and any of their any of their basic claims. We have to move past this if we're going to counter the coronavirus. If we're going to protect our privacy, and and as I said, I think continue to be a healthy society and democracy. Well, I appreciate your attempt to close us out with a bit of bipartisan optimism. <laughs> As someone who as someone who studies partisanship and transpartisanship, that is always most welcome. Um, thank you so much. Thank you to the audience for spending your lunch hour with us. Um, and if you if David's uh, book piqued your interest, you can go back to our New America event page on our website and find how to order in deep at Solid State Books. Um, thank you all and stay safe.